Peter B. Collins, News and Comment. It's Tuesday, April 25th, 2017. And you know what? This is podcast number 2000 from PeterBCollins.com. Wow. Almost nine years ago, it was in June, we started the podcast after I ended my nationally syndicated radio show. That was in March of 2009. And many people have supported my work verbally, offered me encouragement, and many people have provided financial support in the hundreds worldwide. And I am gratified by the acceptance, the validation that that indicates. And at the risk of offending people whose names aren't about to be mentioned, I do want to single out three people. Paul Elsesser from Northern California. He lives north of Sacramento. Margaret Anderson from Seattle. And John Zweibel from Hawaii. They have been supporters from the beginning and have been extremely generous in that support. And I'm very grateful. I could not have done it without you. And I'm very glad to be talking with you once again. Let's have a big round of applause for people who support the PBC podcast. And back to the grisly news of the death machinery in the state of Arkansas, which claimed two more convicts last night. And the dirty death machinery is immoral to begin with. The idea that the state can kill people for killing people and that that is biblical justice or any kind of justice is something that I have never agreed with. But when you see the slimy, sleazy manner in which the state operates outside the law, believing apparently that the end of concluding executions justifies almost any means, and the U.S. Supreme Court has basically given carte blanche to state governments to snuff out the lives of their capital criminals, without much concern about the Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment. And in the first double execution since 2000, Arkansas, yep, yeah, they did a double header last night, even though courts briefly intervened between round one and round two because the observers of the first execution of Jack Jones said that he suffered a torturous and inhumane execution. So it was appealed to U.S. District Judge Christine Baker. She briefly issued a stay of execution for the second man scheduled to die, Marcel Williams. As court filings argued that his execution would demonstrate an ongoing constitutional violation, cruel, unusual, and inhumane infliction of pain and suffering. Just an hour later, she lifted the stay for reasons stated in the court's hearing on his emergency motion. And I don't know the details of that, so I can't tell you what rationale was uh, applied properly or otherwise. Now, the race to kill these men is running because the drugs that they acquired through nefarious means have an expiration date at the end of April. And so Asa Hutchinson, former congressman, knuckle-dragging public Christianist, he was determined to kill as many of these men as possible. Now, according to inmates' attorneys, in the attempt to kill Jones, they tried for 45 minutes to place an IV, a central line, into this man's neck. Apparently, he was a very large guy, three or 400 pounds, and they weren't successful. And then they said they placed it elsewhere on his body. But we don't have the details of the actual location where they found a vein. Then Jones was moving his lips, gulping for air. His movements after the midazolam, that's the first of the three-drug cocktail, uh, was administered is evidence of continued consciousness. But the Supreme Court, and now with a killer like Neil Gorsuch, who was the pivotal vote in approving the last-minute execution last week of another Arkansas prisoner, the death machinery knows no limits. And 
I was struck by an interview on 60 Minutes Sunday night with, uh, I guess, the guy who is perhaps the most conservative member of the uh, nominally liberal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals based here in San Francisco. Alex Kozinski was appointed by Ronald Reagan way back in the 80s when he was in his uh, 30s. He's been on the court forever. And uh, while he is a gadfly of a very uh, strong conservative and libertarian stripe, his bluntness about capital punishment is something I welcome. He said, look, if the state is going to kill somebody, why not use a firing squad or a guillotine? He said they have a 0% failure rate, and it makes us confront the inhumanity of what we are doing. Now, I don't know that he used the term inhumanity. Those are my words. But he talked about the need to confront the reality of what the state is doing, and he thinks lethal injection is too easy. It, it seems like, oh, you're just putting somebody to sleep. I thought that was interesting, and it certainly provoked thought for me. The Intercept is reporting that the medical director of the state of Arkansas may have broken the law in acquiring the drugs for these executions. And get this, we are not permitted to know the name of the medical director of the state of Arkansas. They have secrecy laws that are quite sweeping and hide the identities of anybody who's involved in executions. People who are unknown, well, they can be beyond the reach of the law. And a lawsuit filed by McKesson, that's a San Francisco-based pharmaceutical distributor. They have a huge percentage of the market. We talked about them last week, about their uh, role in the uh, delivery of oxycodone drugs that have produced huge waves of, uh, of addiction. Anyway, McKesson claims that the Arkansas Department of Corrections leveraged its medical director's medical license to purchase vercuronium bromide, a muscle relaxant used as uh, one of these three drugs. And so whoever the secret medical director is in Arkansas may be facing a lawsuit or even a criminal prosecution because uh, the Arkansas Medical Board has regulations that prohibit the prescription and administration of drugs for anything other than a legitimate medical purpose. And killing someone is not considered a legitimate medical purpose. And it's interesting that the pharmaceutical industry has uh, actually created these pretty substantial roadblocks for the state killing machinery. So <laughs> uh, the identity of the medical director should be known to the uh, medical board in Arkansas, and uh, they should be able to uh, bring disciplinary proceedings. But, of course, that board probably reports to the governor, and uh, he could squelch that with a phone call or two. And this does bring it back to Asa Hutchinson. And uh, I, I think that uh, people can properly judge him for his uh, bloodthirsty uh, approach to his duties as governor of Arkansas. So the other angle here that's interesting is that Vice News located the Swiss chemist who invented midazolam. He is 80 years old now. His name is Armin Wassler. No, Walzer, I'm sorry, W-A-L-S-E-R. He first synthesized the drug uh, back in uh, 1974 when he was working for a pharmaceutical company in New Jersey. And he's deeply offended that his invention is part of the lethal cocktail that is being administered, he says, look, you know, they don't need to use my drug. Why don't they just use a Valium, you know, injectable Valium? He said it will produce the same kind of result. And he is offended that to date, midazolam has been used in 21 executions, including botched ones in Oklahoma, Ohio, and Alabama. And when asked how he felt when he found out that his drug is being used in an execution, he said, I was disappointed. I did not work on the drug to kill people. On the contrary, it's to help them. I didn't raise a campaign to stop using midazolam. That's not my job. But I was pleased to know that the company that introduced it was fighting against its use as a sedative for execution. They should do away with executions anyway. 
I mean, there are many countries that don't have executions, and they're doing all right as far as the law is concerned. That's a very interesting sidebar story. Meanwhile, the Trump White House has summoned every single member of the United States Senate to a secret briefing to be held at the White House in the Executive Office Building Auditorium on Wednesday. The topic is the brewing confrontation with North Korea. And in my lifetime, I cannot recall an incident or an event that caused the president to summon all of the members of the Senate to his turf. There have been times when the president has gone to Capitol Hill to meet with a group or even, uh, you know, the entire body. But this is a bit of a first. And my basic sense of this is that, like so many things, Trump is exaggerating the threat posed by the bully boy Kim Jong-un in North Korea. And as I have argued repeatedly, the best way to deal with a bully who's saying, look at me, is to turn your back. And yet we're giving him all kinds of face time. We are exaggerating the threat that he poses and, you know, hanging on every day when, you know, we're saying, well, it was his grandfather's birthday and now it's some anniversary of the military there. And these are all supposed to be events that could lead to a nuclear weapons test or the launch of more missiles. And I think all this gives him an audience. And he laps it up. Now, I'm not saying there is zero threat from North Korea, but unless we continue to tweak Kim Jong-un and send our submarines like we sent the, uh, 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 the Michigan, the USS Michigan, into a South Korean harbor today, and the Carl Vinson aircraft carrier fleet is apparently finally steaming toward North Korea. But I think that this is a, a really very much the wrong track. And I predict that very few senators will come out of that briefing and say, ah, you know, I don't see there's much of a threat here. They're all going to, you know, say, mm, you yeah, we learned a lot and we better give him more money. And, you know, we've got to threaten the North Koreans and put more meaningless sanctions on them. So I, I think that we are definitely on the wrong track here. And what's really strange is yesterday Trump held a lunch with the ambassadors from U.N. member states who have seats on the Security Council. And not a single representative from the State Department was present. He did bring in his U.S. Uh, or his U.N. ambassador, Nikki Haley, who he then tweaked in front of this international group and said, do you like her? Because if not, I could replace her. And then he said, just kidding. I mean, that is so juvenile and inappropriate in a meeting where he's trying to get them to take seriously that uh, there should be a world response to North Korea. And the extent to which Trump is going to organize uh, international support for shaming North Korea into some sort of compliance with world order, I have no objection. And he appears to have gotten support from the Chinese. That's a good thing. That's a good development. China keeps saying, hey, don't go ballistic, Donald. Don't go ballistic. Let's work this out. But I fear that our impulsive... Twitter head president will act impulsively and that we will sharply regret it. Meanwhile, today, when the USS Michigan came into the South Korean port of Busan, North Korea launched a series of cruise missiles. And they claim that some 300 to 400 long-range artillery pieces capable of hitting uh, Seoul, the South Korean capital, uh, were active in this. Now, I, I don't know that they all launched. I don't know that there was a 400-round uh, barrage, but uh, this was a fairly significant military exercise, and we've got to make sure that these exercises don't turn into an accidental trigger for conflict. The Trump administration also announced new sanctions against 271 employees of the Syrian government agency that produces chemical weapons and ballistic missiles. And this, again, is based on the unproven assertions from Trump and others that are widely accepted as fact that it was the Syrian government responsible for the chemical incident in Khan Shakun almost a month ago. And as we know, 
Professor Ted Postel, retired from MIT, has thoroughly debunked the so-called evidence that was supplied by the White House to support their claims. And I want to direct you to my friend Brad Friedman at bradblog.com because his podcast yesterday features an interview with Professor Postel. I hope you will check that out. Meanwhile, Jason Chaffetz, the Utah Republican House member who has uh, vaguely announced that he's not going to seek re-election in ne next year, 2018, and who's been the subject of rumors that he was about to resign as recently as last Friday, well, he's still there. And he went public today and suggested that Mike Flynn, the retired general who was a national security advisor to Trump for 22 days or whatever it was, that he may have violated federal law by not fully disclosing his business dealings with Russia when he sought a security clearance to work in the administration. Now, coming from a Republican and a guy well-placed chairman of the Oversight Committee in the House, uh, this is a bit surprising, and it does up the ante. But keep in mind that the House Intelligence Committee is uh, basically out of action in terms of any Trump-Russia investigation. While Devin Nunes has stepped down, uh, the committee's in disarray, and as far as I know, nothing is happening. And we were told that the adults in the Senate Intelligence Committee, led by Richard Burr and Mark Warner from Virginia, Republican and Democrat respectively, that they were the adults, the serious people who were going to give us the investigation that everyone would find credible. And Jennifer Rubin, who is a conservative columnist for the Washington Post, says that the Senate investigation is a joke, and Americans know it, because a new poll, NBC News and Wall Street Journal poll, shows that three-quarters of Americans say they want an independent, nonpartisan commission instead of Congress to investigate Trump-Russia. 73% prefer the independent investigation. Only 16% believe that Congress should do the job. And 61% of Americans say they have little or no confidence in Congress conducting a fair and impartial investigation into Russia's alleged involvement in the 2016 election. And at the same time, the Daily Beast has reported that the Senate Intelligence Committee isn't doing diddly. More than three months after they announced that it agreed on the scope of the investigation, they haven't begun substantially investigating possible ties between the Trump campaign and Russia. The investigation does not have a single staffer dedicated to it full-time, and the people working on it part-time don't have significant investigative experience. No interviews have been conducted with key individuals, including Mike Flynn, <laughs> Carter Page, the guy who's been outed as a, a recruit of Russian spies before he became part of the Trump campaign and traveled twice to Russia last summer. Now, as you know, I remain skeptical because we have been provided zero public evidence of all of these allegations. And as soon as they provide us public evidence, I'll react and I'll take a position. But meanwhile, I'm skeptical, and this doesn't do anything to develop any confidence that we're going to see any change. It looks like this is just going to stay gridlocked until people grow tired of it and move on. Interesting shift from the Donald yesterday. While he says today that he remains committed to his border wall along the southern border, he appears to have dialed back his demand that some form of funding for it be included in this stopgap budget bill that uh, has to be passed by Friday or the government could shut down. And it appears Trump is smart enough not to uh, really add more pressure that could lead to this potential government shutdown. But <laughs> even as I say that, he is uh, loading up with demands for tax cuts for his buddies, for corporations. And uh, what we're learning is that he doesn't feel required to pay for those by cutting programs in response to the expected drop in revenue or increasing taxes in other categories to offset the presumed loss of revenues that could amount to as much as $7 trillion over the next 10 years. And remember all those deficit hawks who said that Obama couldn't do anything without paying for it? 
And when Obama passed that uh, stimulus package in the first months of his administration back in 2009, the Republicans jammed it up with a lot of meaningless bullshit that didn't help stimulate the economy. And then they turned around and blamed him for increasing the federal deficit because he had to spend money to recover from the Republican-engineered economic meltdown in 2008. And Obama never properly blamed and tagged the Republicans with responsibility for that. And so Trump is figuring out that, uh, gosh, Mexico is probably not going to pay for the wall. Even many Republicans are squeamish about building a wall. The intimidation factor of Trump in the White House has led to a sharp decline on of traffic on the southern border, which means that the cost-effectiveness of this would be even less than one can imagine. And there is a new uh, uh, study, and we'll cite the source, and you, you know you can trust it or not, but a new report issued by Senate Democrats last week put the projected cost of a border wall at $70 billion. And Trump has said maybe 8 or 10. <laughs> the most reasonable outside estimate has been at least $20 billion. But, I mean, who's counting? We're not worried about deficits. doesn't matter. And it was Dick Cheney who fired uh, one of George W. Bush's appointees. I'm trying to remember his name. He was a commerce secretary or something because uh, he had spoken out against tax cuts. And Cheney said, look, it's our turn. We can do what we want. Who cares about the deficit when we're in office? We only hammer the Democrats over the deficit. And we've got Steve Mnuchin, the uh, guy who came out of the mortgage industry and the king of foreclosures here in, at IndyMac in California. Well, he's playing uh, Lath Laffer. Arthur Laffer was the economist who advised Ronald Reagan that tax cuts pay for themselves because magically more revenue arrives when people pay a lower tax rate. The real Laffer of the Laffer curve is the fuzzy math required to try to make the numbers work out. And meanwhile, one of the leaders of the Republicans in the Senate, Orrin Hatch, Finance Committee Chairman, he's one of those people who hammered Obama over paying for his tax breaks or any other programs, including Obamacare. But Hatch is now flexible. I'm open to getting this country moving, he said. If the tax cut will stimulate the economy, then he's not as bothered by it as uh, it, by the impact it has on budget deficits. <laughs> oh, these bastards. They really are. I want to thank a listener named Bob who emailed me, and I only know his name is Bob, but he tipped me off to Robert Fisk's column from last Friday in Britain's Independent. And the headline reads, Donald Trump's first 100 days. The madder he gets, the more seriously the world takes him. Now, this madness is not anger. This is uh, idiocy. It's craziness. And he opens with this. The more dangerous America's crack, crackpot president becomes, the saner the world believes him to be. Just look back at the initial half of his first 100 days. The crazed tweeting, the lies, the fantasies, and self-regard of this misogynist leader of the Western world appalled all of us. But the moment he went to war in Yemen, fired missiles at Syria, and bombed Afghanistan, even the U.S. media Trump had so ferociously condemned, began to treat him with respect, and so did the rest of the world. It's one thing to have a lunatic in the White House who watches late-night television and tweets all day, but when the same lunatic goes to war, it now emerges. He's a safer bet for democracy, a strong president who stands up to tyrants, unless they happen to be Saudis, Turks, or Egyptians, and who acts out of human emotion rather than cynicism. This is preposterous, says Fisk, a madman who goofs off at something he doesn't like on CNN. It's just plain wacky. A man of unsound mind who attacks three Muslim countries, two of which were included in his seven Muslim nation refugee ban, is a danger to the world. Yet the moment he fires 59 missiles at Syria after more than 60 civilians die in an apparent chemical attack, which he blames on Assad, but none after far more are massacred by a Syrian suicide bomber, even Angela Merkel takes leave of her senses and praises Trump. Well, Fisk gets it right. I've linked to his commentary in the show file for today's podcast. 
Well, corporate governance doesn't really work in this country. If it did, there would be some former Wells Fargo directors today. But all of the 15 directors were reelected by shareholders today in the annual meeting. And this after the board failed to curb the excessive marketing strategies that led to millions of false accounts being created, bonuses being paid to people for fraudulent actions. This was all overseen by the departed former chairman, John Stumpf, who profited from it, and correctly, the board clawed back some of his, his money. But the director who came closest to being unseated was Enrique Hernandez, head of the board's risk committee, who was reelected with only 53% of the vote. And that's pretty stunning for corporate shareholder actions. I'd love to see some of these people bounced, but it didn't happen today. Last Saturday night in Oakland, near the Coliseum where the Raiders are evacuating and the Oakland A's play ball, and the Golden State Warriors are going to vacate that facility soon. Well, there's a BART station there, the uh, subway system, Bay Area Rapid Transit. And in less than two minutes, a flash mob of teenagers swarmed this station. They ran in. Many people jumped over the turnstiles. It was reported that between 40 to 60 juveniles participated in this two-minute drill. And some of them streamed into a, a BART train that stopped at the station, confronting, robbing, and in some cases beating riders. There were seven people robbed. Six people were robbed inside the train and a seventh out on the platform. Police report there were no uh, guns or other weapons being brandished. It was just a mob scene, and they injected enough fear that people coughed up their uh, belongings. And this is a real challenge for the authorities. Uh, this has never happened before in the Bay Area, and it remains to be seen what kind of actions will be taken to curb this in the future. In Las Vegas, a jury has found two men guilty of federal charges from the armed standoff back on federal lands in 2014. Remember, Cliven Bundy declared war on the Department of Interior, said he wouldn't pay the grazing fees that he hadn't been paying anyway, and this led to a confrontation with a lot of vigilantes who showed up with their guns. And a guy named Greg Burleson of Arizona was found guilty of eight charges, including threatening and assaulting a federal officer. Todd Engel of Idaho was found guilty of obstruction and extortion. There are others, I believe, in that trial uh, or related trials. And finally, this strikes me as bizarre, but in New Orleans the other night, the city decided to take down a racist monument that was uh, a memorial to a white supremacist uprising back in 1874. It is a, a really ugly relic of the Jim Crow South. And this 35-foot granite obelisk, the Liberty Place Monument, was dismantled in the middle of the night by public workers who were uh, wearing masks and bulletproof vests because the fear was that white armed individuals would come out and take a few pot shots at the workers as they remove the monument. There were no incidents reported, but the fact that these precautions were taken, I think, is an ugly statement about America today. And as we wrap up the podcast, I've got a bonus for you. Gary Chu, the official film reviewer of the Peter B. Collins podcast, wants to recommend a new film about war propaganda called Their Finest. If the British Empire and its Commonwealth lasts for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. Then there's the novel Their Finest Hour and a Half, written by Lisa Evans. It would seem that combining those two disparate threads would really task a writer. You know, Churchill's echoing and solemn declaration from 1940 with its ponderous implications and in typical British humor, almost Monty Pythonian, play on Winnie's grand rhetoric. Oh, but that's where I'm wrong, and likely you are as well. Good writing is the solution. The drama and angst of World War II and a Brit government arduously piecing together a propaganda film to boost the spirits of Britain's war-weary can be enlightening and entertaining. 
Specifically, a British film crew attempting to punch up morale, making a war effort movie after the Blitzkrieg and Dunkirk evacuation. I grew up on war propaganda movies. Mine were mostly made in Hollywood, some overseas. The British movies were more clever, but American versions had the same effect on the mind of a young Kansas boy who knows there's an awful war being fought on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. The titles I best recall are A Yank and the RAF from 1941, Mrs. Miniver and Casablanca from 1942, The White Cliffs of Dover of 44, and The Duke of Wayne in 1945, Back to Bataan. Of course, three more recent war films that will more than always blow me away are Sophie's Choice, Schindler's List, and The Pianist. Lists for war movie titles are almost as long as the permanence of fighting them persists. Their finest was directed by a Danish woman named Lone Skerfig. She also gave us the excellent film in education and the delightful One Day. Gabby Chiappi adapted their finest script from Evan's book. Rachel Portman wrote the music. Also, earlier Portman composed the marvelous score for the Michael Caine film The Cider House Rules. That melody still runs in my head from time to time. Well, are you beginning to see a constant in the creation of Their Finest? Yes, females did it. So you can't be surprised to learn that Skerfix's movie is wonderfully feminist. The twist, however, other than coupling World War with the comedic story of Brits producing wartime propaganda films, is that the principal female character, Katrin Cole, played by Gemma Arterton, is totally feminine. Awesomely as well. She confounds all the stiff upper lip guys on the movie set who are convinced that a woman is not quite capable of making such motion pictures. This conflict runs amok mainly among the film's creative writing team. What? A movie about people who write movies? Surely I must kid you. No, I'm not. This is the genius of their finest. Every other kind of movie person seen in this movie is given a back seat, so to speak. Even the dashing and mature but fictitious British thespian known far and wide as Ambrose Hilliard, played by the mighty Bill Nighy. It's Hilliard who finally takes on an important role in the production. Who says Bill Nighy wasn't born to do this part? He is simply magnificent as Ambrose. But so is Arterton as Catron. She's just about perfect and wins the game so graciously, always with disarming feminine aplomb. How can you not go see this movie? You can't. Besides, Jeremy Irons, in a haughty elitist cameo, may give his finest quarter hour in one bigger-than-life scene. It is a capital performance by Jeremy. So go and enjoy living emotions that I felt when I was about six years old. Mine have stayed with me all this time. And don't ever forget that good writing is the heart of fine cinema. The CGI and all else come afterward. Do I make myself clear? For the Peter B. Collins Podcast, I'm Gary Chu in Sacramento. Thanks for your review, Gary Chu. And I'm Peter B. Collins reminding you that this podcast is free and available every day on YouTube. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling up.